think we're good to go finally. Can you hear me? All right. Thanks uh, for coming out today, and uh, thanks, Cynthia, for organizing another uh, GIS uh, day event at the U of M. It's my first one, but it's a good crowd. It's uh, good to see you all out. Um, so today's uh, presentation uh, by Kayla and myself uh, is going to be on uh, uh, using Survey123 um, and, uh, and uh, for the uh, water and uh, craft inspection program um, for aquatic invasive species. So we're going to be talking about uh, that uh, program, uh, Kayla is. I'm then going to be talking about uh, Survey123 uh, app um, and uh, how I've applied it to the watercraft inspection surveys and um, hopefully have time for a demo, uh, talk about challenges and uh, next steps as well. Um, but before I go on, uh, I just wanted to dedicate this presentation to a friend of mine and I know some folks uh, in the room know uh, Janos as well. He was uh, passed away recently, uh, tragically, while vacationing and uh, He's a, a good, uh, solid GIS professional, and he loved to fish, particularly fly fish. So uh, uh, I know he, he would uh, approve of anything that uh, maintained a healthy fisheries. So with that, I'll pass it on to uh, Kayla. Hi everybody, uh, thanks for the intro Tony. Um, so yeah, my name is Kayla Funk and I coordinate the watercraft inspection program within the uh, Aquatic Invasive Species Program uh, with Manitoba Sustainable Development. So I'm just going to give you guys a brief background um, about AIS and our program and our program needs and then Tony's going to go in and talk about um, Survey123 and what he actually developed for us. Um, so Aquatic Invasive Species, I'm going to use the acronym AIS quite a bit makes it a lot shorter, but basically they're just any non-native uh, plants, animals, parasites, diseases. Uh, they are introduced to areas either intentionally or accidentally, and once they're in a new area, they can cause problems. They'll uh, outcompete the native species for resources, and they can have ecological, uh, social, economic, and health impacts. Um, one species that's causing huge uh, problems in Manitoba that some of you may have heard about are zebra mussels. Um, these are just some of the examples of negative impacts that they have. Um, they, they're filter feeders, so they increase water clarity, which can um, increase uh, toxic algal blooms. Those are the big uh, blue-green algae that you hear about in Lake Winnipeg. Um, in turn, they also decrease native mussel populations by outcompeting them for resources, as well as native fish populations. Recreationally, uh, they can attach to any hard substrate underwater, so they increase drag on boats by attaching to the hulls of boats. They can clog motors. Uh, decreasing the fish populations will affect um, our sport fishing opportunities as we have a huge sport fishery in Manitoba. Um, industry and water supply, so they'll clog any sort of water intake pipes that are um, situated in the water, disrupting water supply to homes, industry, cottages, as well as economic impacts. So in turn, if they're clogging, for example, hydro infrastructure, it's going to result in increased maintenance costs and then increased cost to the end consumer as well. Uh, one of our biggest challenges is not only um, preventing the spread of AIS like zebra mussels that we already have in Manitoba and also preventing introduction of a new species into Manitoba. So for example, the Great Lakes watershed, which is just our next door neighbor has over 250 invasive species that Manitoba doesn't yet have and we don't want. Um, and then within Manitoba, for example, there's 170,000 recreational fishing licenses sold in a year. A lot of fishers use boats. Those boats can then move these invasive species to other water bodies within the province. We have over 100,000 water bodies in the province um, and only a handful of those actually have invasive species. We want to prevent uh, those other water bodies from becoming contaminated with invasive species. One of the ways we try to combat this spread is through our watercraft inspection program. Basically, what we do is we have watercraft inspection stations at various pinch points on highways who are trying to intercept boats that are traveling from water bodies going to other water bodies. 
Uh, we ask them questions, educate them about invasive species, and then if we determine that a boat is a risk for transporting invasive species, we perform decontaminations as well. Um, this last open water season, which would have been 2016, we had new legislation in place. Um, up until this point, watercraft inspections have been purely or purely voluntary, and now under the new legislation, they're mandatory, and it allowed us to set up on highways. Um, so this season, we completed uh, over 5,000 watercraft inspections. Uh, we in expect this number to increase dramatically now that we're onto full highway operations. Um, so each watercraft inspection, each of those 5,042 watercraft inspections, uh, one of these forms was filled out and there was a paper form and we're collecting a lot of information here. I'm not going to go into detail about all of the fields, but some of the broad categories were inspection information like the location, um, where the inspection is being conducted, um, information about the actual watercraft, we have some personal information like license plate numbers, watercraft registration numbers, um, and then what was done throughout the inspection, so what parts of the boat were inspected, what was found, um, and other things like that. So that was sort of um, being that that's a lot of information. We're expecting our inspection numbers to increase dramatically. Other jurisdictions conduct between 20,000 and 30,000 of these highway inspections per year. Uh, so we definitely don't want to have to be filling out one of those paper forms every single time we do a watercraft inspection. So we wanted a way to move away from paper and to digital. Um, some of our needs that we had or that we were wanting was real-time data entry and real-time review. So as soon as an entry is um, uploaded, then me in the office, I could go and see what was being done across the province. We have inspection stations all over Manitoba, um, so I'm not able to communicate directly with each station every single day. So from my computer, I would like to be able to see the activities that are happening um, on a large scale. Um, Geo-referencing, so we have some fixed stations where we always know the location of those, but we also have potential to have mobile teams. So we might not always have, um, know their exact location. So to be able to geo-reference their location would be excellent. Um, something that already has a database framework built in, uh, the ability to uh, analyze that data, something that's really user-friendly uh, so that any of our seasonal watercraft inspectors will be able to pick it up and use it fairly easily. And then also it would improve our interaction with the public and our customer service by being able to expedite this process a little bit more. So I'll turn it over to Tony now to talk about uh, the product. All right, so we, uh, I know some, some friends in, in, in fisheries and, and uh, they knew that we were doing um, uh, some work uh, in forestry with iPads and with mobile applications. So we, we got together and uh, uh, with, with our fisheries friends and we talked to them about what we were doing in forestry in terms of mobile data collection and, and use of ArcGIS Online. And, uh, and uh, given their needs, the, the possibility of using Survey123 uh, for ArcGIS to collect uh, some of that data was discussed. Um, and it looked like it was, it was a potential solution to address those issues that, that were identified. Uh, so Survey123 uh, for ArcGIS, for those that are not familiar with it, is, uh, is a form-based uh, mobile data collection application. So um, uh, you, you've heard others talk about Collector for ArcGIS, and that's more of a map-centric um, data collection application. Uh, Survey123 uh, can still collect information on uh, your location and, and, and drop a point, but you have a form and uh, location maybe isn't as critical, uh, it could be the app that, that you want to try. So if you've got uh, inspections as we had here, watercraft inspections, if you're doing interviews with the public or others, uh, doing surveys, assessments, assessing uh, inventories, uh, it, it's, it's potentially an application that, that could serve your needs. Um, so similar to uh, Collector, Survey123 works offline and online. Uh, it does require an ArcGIS Online account, organizational account. 
Um, you can run it on smartphones and tablets. You can download it from various uh, stores online. Um, you can also run it on your desktop as well and laptops using uh, Windows OS or Linux. Um, um, Survey123 Connect is a separate um, uh, product or application that you would install on your, uh, your desktop or laptop computer that you would use to author your uh, surveys or you could use to author your surveys and it, it, it uses um, uh, XLS smart forms uh, in Excel um, and I'll show you some of that later. So again creating surveys you can use either Survey123 Connect for ArcGIS, an application you install on your computer or they've introduced recently as we have uh, a web-based means of uh, creating uh, surveys online uh, that are easier to use but at this point the functionality of what you can do with Survey123 Connect is, is limited um, when compared to that. Um, uh, so, uh, Kayla showed you the, uh, the survey that they use to collect information on, um, on uh, watercraft inspections. One of the critical things that, that you need to, I think, understand before you undertake a Survey123 uh, project is, is what is it that they're collecting and, and what is the logic around how they're collecting that. So uh, they put together this uh, workflow so that I can understand the issue to put together the application uh, using Survey123. So after you collect some basic information, uh, on on the uh, during the inspection survey, you get into the seal verification. Uh, you know, uh, is the seal present? Yes or no. Um, you know, what's the seal color? And you, without going into details, you go through this this kind of hierarchy or key of questions that get asked, and um, and that's critical to understand when you're building the survey uh, because. Uh, survey one, two, three is, is they say it's a smart survey. You create a smart survey. So one question that you ask leads to questions, subsequent questions. So if you have a simple question that requires a yes, no answer, uh, and if, if the user, if you enter yes, you know, that can bring up a series of questions. But if you enter no, it'll bring up another series of questions. And so there's some, some, some smartness to, to survey one, two, three. Uh, you're just not collecting information on any every attribute as you kind of do within um, within collector. Um, so with, with respect to watercraft inspections, once I understood the the kind of business workflow, um, I I used Survey One Two Three Connect to create the survey. Um, uh, it's it's really a, a spreadsheet editor in Excel using XLS forms. Uh, then you uh, publish, or while you're doing that, you can view the survey as you're making changes in Survey123 Connect. So you can make changes here, um, and then you, you update it, and you'll see those, uh, those changes take effect in your survey. Um, and then uh, once you're happy with the survey, then you publish it, and, and it's published to the Survey123 uh, Hub. And that's the website for, for that Survey123 Hub. If you want to download Survey123, um, you, uh, you can connect there uh, to download it. Um, you can, as I mentioned, in addition to Survey123 Connect, you can also author and manage your surveys in uh, the Survey123 Hub, and you can view results as survey information is collected, um, uh, either online or, or afterwards synced. Uh, to ArcGIS on a line cloud, you can take a look at that, at that data. Um, so here's some screenshots of, of that. Uh, you can get the total uh, you know, number of surveys that have been entered, number of people that have participated. So in this case, 313 people entered surveys. Um, and you can just get a sense of, of how the surveys are coming along and, and you can actually you know, get locations of those surveys as well. And this is just a screenshot of some data that, that have, was collected in Africa. So I'm going to see if I can quickly go into uh, a quick demo. So this is the Survey123 hub um, where you have different surveys. I've got a number here, but I'll, I'll uh, 
try connecting to the watercraft and inspections one. If I still have internet. Yeah, I had that before, but I still was connected, uh, which is odd. Um, Well, if this isn't going to work, I can maybe show those that are really interested in it afterwards if, if I get a connection later, because I know we're a little bit pressed for time. Um, but what I wanted to show was the Survey 1, 2, um, well, actually, I could bring up Survey 1, 2, 3, Connect. Let me do that. Uh, so this is the application that exists on your desktop that you use to author um, your survey, or how, how I use to author the survey. Um, it, ha it provides more functionality than, than the online. So I'll, um, I'll just bring in the survey here. So, um, so that's the survey. Like you can scroll down and see all the various questions that get asked. But when you're authoring your survey, um, this is the XLS forms that, that kind of pops up. So, I mean, it probably looks more intimidating than it is. Um, it's, there's really no programming involved, but you need to understand, you know, what you're doing and, and the questions you need to ask. So, um, so each record essentially represents uh, something in the survey. So, um, you know, in this one, I, the, the, the type of, of survey question, it's, it's going to be entered as a text uh, this field represents the, uh, the attribute in the database that's getting created. So uh, a lot of people like this application because you don't need to build your GEO database uh, uh, beforehand. You just need to understand and create a survey. And when you do that, the GEO database, the feature service gets created in the back end uh, based on the questions that you've asked. So that's, those are the fields. This is just uh, the, the prompt, uh, and then you get um, you can you know indicate if it's a required field or not. Um, there's some logic here uh, in this column that indicates if you've selected uh, you know other location previously, then this pops up. Um, so this is survey one two three connect and how how I use it to author the survey, and then. Uh, once you're, you're done that, then you would publish the survey and it would go to the cloud and say, okay, it pushes the survey up to the cloud. And then you can access that survey uh, through Survey123, uh, the mobile app on your mobile device. You would download that survey. Uh, you can collect data locally or rather online or disconnect it. Um, so just to show you some of the smart, what I mean when I say smart, uh, a smart survey form, let me just scroll down here. So this is some basic information that we, we enter. So there are drop downs. You can, you know, whatever jurisdiction the boat is from, you would select that. Um, watercraft type, you, you indicate, you know, these could be drop downs or different ways of showing this information, whether or not ballast tanks are present. Um, you know, so this is, if I click yes, then I get another question pop up that says, well, how many ballast tanks are present in that boat? Is the verification seal already exist? You know, if so, this pops up, okay, what's, what's the seal color that exists? Um, you know, if it's green or whatever. Um, is the seal valid? You know, so you continue to go through the survey, but as you 
answer questions on the survey, it, it may pop up other questions. So that's why understanding the logic is, is critical. You can embed photos. So if there's some, some, uh, you know, some feature that you want to highlight for your survey crews, they're not sure where the hull of a boat is or something, um, you, know, you can do that. Um, um, so that, that's the survey. Uh, let me just go back to the presentation then. So some of the challenges that, that, that got, we encountered, certainly the, this was new technology at the time of, 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 of uh, imp implementing this or trying it out. Survey 1, 2, 3 was still in beta, uh, beta format. Uh, so Esri still weren't fully supporting it. Now it's a fully supported product. Um, uh, we, we, were, uh, we were using it on iPads, uh, so it took a bit of a while to, for some folks to get used to the, uh, the hardware um, and just learning the, the new software. Like I, I just fumbled my way in many cases to try to understand Survey123. Um, and this, like I said, the, the, the functionality of Survey123 continues to increase monthly. You, they, they usually push out an update, believe it or not, every month, and there's always new functionality that that is that gets added. Um, one of the big ones, certainly with with uh, with both of us, was uh, in fisheries, was the privacy concerns. Uh, like Kayla mentioned the um, you know the collection of watercraft um, or, or license plate numbers, and uh, and that's something that that just not permitted to. We didn't want to store that information in the cloud. Um, so, uh, so we didn't actually use this last year. The timing didn't work out. They hadn't ordered uh, their iPad devices yet. Um, uh, but we're going to try something we'll, in the next slide. We'll, we'll talk about that um, for, for this coming season. Um, we haven't, we're, Survey 123 is supposed to work in disconnected mode. Uh, we've tried it in forestry with some um, other forestry plot work that we've done and it works. So I'm um, hoping that it's, it's not going to be an issue here. Um, the fisheries are, I mean, Sir Kill Anson, there's like five, 6,000 surveys they can, collected this past year on paper. Um, that program, you know, at least that many this year probably, probably may expand. So just the long-term data management is, is going to be something that, that we're going to have to work on. And then next steps is Kayla. Thanks, so we're on the last slide here. So just want to talk about next steps quickly. Like Tony mentioned, we didn't get a chance to use it this year. And that was mostly due to privacy concerns. Our privacy officer um, indicated that we wouldn't be comfortable uh, housing things like license plate numbers on the cloud, um, especially since Esri's cloud is, is housed in, or the um, server is on US soil. So um, some possible uh, way to mitigate that concern would be with the um, like a Manitoba cloud or a portal for GIS. Um, and then once we get that, we would be able to house that information here. So that might mitigate that concern, um, but we're hoping to trial. We have our iPads now, so hoping to start trialing it this year. Even if we don't get the FIPA concerns dealt with, we could find ways to leave those fields out and record them elsewhere on paper so we can at least try out the rest of the survey. Um, and then Exploring long-term database options to deal with, you know, thinking long-term when we start getting into um, large amounts of records, um, how we're going to go about uh, storing that data, and then we can also incorporate other sort of data like our, our AIS monitoring data and stuff like that and see if we can get sort of an uh, integrated approach to our data storage. So that's all uh, we have, unless Tony has anything else to add. So if either any of you have questions for myself or Tony, um, I don't know if, how much time we have. But one question. One question. <laughs> In order to get something that's FIPA, FIPA compliant, I wonder if you know, ArcGIS or you know, some other uh, you know, 
knows of, you know, maybe provide some service that, that could be sort of like HIPAA compliant in the future. If there's yeah, any I know. Maybe you made a comment. My, my understanding was that uh, that was an issue, but the, the potential of personal information like the license plate number, um, like that database somehow being hacked and, and I mean, even though like we don't have, we, we weren't recording the names of individuals, no. no, it was just the license number. Uh, so, I mean, you can walk down the street and get all sorts of license plate numbers. But this was yeah. still a concern. I, we we had a privacy officer that was doing an assessment yeah. on it. I'm not sure that assessment ever got completed. I don't know if it ever got completed. Right, but, but there was a flag raised there uh, to us and to fisheries. And, uh, and that flag, as I understood it, was on U.S. soil mm, could be an issue, and this this vehicle license number could somehow be related, maybe to names in another database. I mean, it. it so at this point, like I said, we're probably just going to try it with, without that information. So I, I guess you know, in, in the future, hopefully there'll be some some certification process. Where you know, RQIS could, could have a server, um, you know, HIPAA certified or certified in various, you know, because these it's become kind of more and more of an issue. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, kind of, uh, was a hiccup for you? Right, so Probably I mean, down the, I mean the, point, the, like, the portal for RQIS is essentially RQIS online internally, and if, if we ever establish that or get that set up, then our concerns or our privacy officer concerns go away because the data is housed in Manitoba's own network and they have more confidence, I suppose, in, in that and the fact that it's not on foreign soil. Yeah. 